Hello, hello. You're welcome to lesson 8. And uh, we are still looking at our topic, nutrition. And today we are looking at digestion in man. So this is uh, a common phenomenon discussed right from our primary schools. People talk about digestion, digestion. So what is digestion for now? Digestion is a process by which complex food substances are broken down into simpler soluble compounds that can be absorbed and utilized by the body yeah so every day we eat food we eat maize we eat posho we eat uh, groundnuts and many other types of foods that we eat every day so what is the effect of this food so this food undergoes a process of digestion and you eat them when they are solid when they are big in large in size complex but at the end of it all the body utilizes them in a very simple form so the process by which this food is changed from this big particulate uh, matter into simpler soluble substances is what we call digestion yeah so digestion can be divided into physical or mechanical digestion yes and then we can also have chemical digestion. So, based on the the, 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 the the type of operation, based on the format of action of the process of digestion, it can be divided into two. We have chemical digestion and physical or mechanical digestion. So, when you look at physical digestion, basically this involves breakdown of food due to the mechanical action of body parts and structures for example action of teeth a process of chewing when you put food in your mouth you start chewing it you're actually conducting physical digestion when that food reaches in the stomach in most cases the stomach does what we call churning the, the stomach walls keep on squeezing that food churning it into fluid uh, fluid like substance a semi-fluid substance called the chime so that process is also physical digestion because it involves action of muscles of the stomach and many other processes that take place that are physical the other one can takes place in the duodenum a process by which fats or i mean or lipids are emulsified are coagulated into simple simple solid particles that can easily be acted upon by enzymes it involves uh, a physical action of the bile a chemical called the bile that is stored in the gallbladder so these are physical processes like you've heard me describe them and that kind of digestion is what we call physical digestion it is equally important that if we do not conduct physical digestion then chemical digestion may not easily be successful so let's move to the other type of digestion based on the action uh, it is called chemical digestion and this is a breakdown of food due to action of chemicals called enzymes so in our bodies we have uh, chemicals that are called enzymes that uh, act on food breaking them further into smaller soluble particles that kind of digestion where enzymes or chemicals are involved is called chemical digestion so based on the format of action we, digestion can be divided into two we have physical digestion that involves physical processes and then we have chemical digestion that involves action of enzymes and then based on uh, where digestion takes place it can also be divided into two extracellular digestion and intracellular digestion extracellular it means that this kind of digestion takes place outside the cells extracellular outside the cells or even outside the body yes in some organisms digestion actually takes place outside the body it is called extracellular digestion and it may not necessarily be outside the body but it may occur inside the body but not inside the cells for example in many organisms including in man we have the, the actual digestion takes place in man mostly takes place extracellularly outside the cells that produce uh, the enzymes uh, and then in some cases like in fungi uh, we have enzymes are secreted outside the body and uh, so that digestion takes place outside the body and therefore 
and then after after digestion has taken place the the food materials that are soluble are absorbed now by the body both in both scenarios we are talking about extracellular digestion and then we have intracellular in this type of digestion it takes place inside the cells hey, this one takes place inside the cells for example in amoeba in paramecium uh, in uh, plasmodium and other organisms that are majorly unicellular they carry out digestion inside their, their cells meaning enzymes are produced within the cell and they act on food materials within the very cell so that one is called intracellular digestion so we have those four terms that i want you to master physical digestion chemical digestion extracellular digestion and intracellular digestion those are all different types of digestion that i want you to master and to differentiate uh -huh. that's great i know you can now differentiate ably those four types of digestion uh, members digestion in man is extracellular digestion because the enzymes are released in the gut cavity where digestion occurs Remember, enzymes are produced by cells. There are cells that produce enzymes. But these enzymes don't act inside those cells. They are secreted. They are released. And then they will act far away from the cells. In an environment outside the cells. For example, in the gut. Yeah? In the alimentary canal. Now, that kind of digestion is called extracellular. So, in man digestion takes place outside the cells that is important for us to note so let's look at the steps that are involved in the digestion of food so there are majorly three steps we have the first one i mean generally in the movement of food there are three major steps there is ingestion then we have after ingesting the food then digestion takes place after digesting the food then ejection or removal of, of the unwanted materials is called digestion also takes place so ingestion is the taking in of food into the body this morning you have taken breakfast whatever you ate cassava maize bread sausage pizza you first ingested it you first ingested that food when you put it in the mouth and you swallow it you are actually ingesting the food yes which food did you ingest in the morning is it bananas is it what did you take whatever it was that good food that you ate you ingested it then after then we have another term called ingestion we already defined digestion after ingestion, then digestion takes place. Breakdown of that food, physically and chemically. Yes? Then we have ingestion after digestion. Now, this is the process by which insoluble and digested compounds of food are discharged or expelled from the body as feces. So, this process also takes place. After digestion, there is not all the food that you have taken will be digested. Yeah? So that food that is not digested, the waste food will be removed from the body because it will not be necessary to stay in the body. So the body has a mechanism of removing it, what we call ingestion. And this takes place every day. You ingest yeah, through a process of defecation. And that food is collectively called the feces, the unwanted food, the unwanted undigested food in the body. So let's look at briefly here the di diagram of the digestive system in man particularly. So when you look at it, uh, it of course has even more parts, more than what is found in the digestive system. But we are just trying to show you all what it involves. Yeah, all the parts. Uh, some parts may not be typical of the digestive system. But I want us to focus more on those that involve digestion for now. So we can see from the head region there, there are some parts. Which parts can you identify that are involved in digestion of food from the head region? Is the ear involved? 
is the parotid gland involved or the salivary glands there are majorly three salivary glands we have the parotid gland the submandibular gland and the sublingual gland those ones are all really saliva from different parts around the mouth then we have the tongue is the tongue involved in the digestion of food does it participate in that process yes in the physical digestion and movement of food the tongue is very important in the swallowing and the rolling of food during the chewing we didn't in indicate the teeth there because you you know about them and we have already looked about looked at the teeth and you know their location and even know now the parts and the types of teeth so let's move down from the mouth you go to the esophagus the food now passes to the esophagus uh, from the esophagus it enters to the stomach to the stomach yes it enters to the what to the stomach from the stomach the stomach has two entrance it has an entrance called the cardiac sphincter which we have not indicated there uh, it's called the cardiac sphincter at the place where the esophagus joins the stomach you can look at that place the place where the esophagus joins the stomach is called the cardiac sphincter it is elastic it is very elastic it allows food to enter in a bit that's why when you are swallowing food doesn't just pour you have to push it meaning there is a, a muscle there which permits it to enter in a bit in a bit yeah that one is called the cardiac sphincter then we have the stomach itself that d-shaped structure there is called the stomach uh, and then after the stomach we have another sphincter called the pyloric sphincter another muscle which prevents food which restricts or which regulates uh, food leaving the stomach into the duodenum so that it enters the you know the stomach is bigger and the duodenum is smaller so if this food is just to pour from the stomach to the duodenum it would not be proportional the duodenum would not accommodate so it allows food to enter into the duodenum bit by bit bit by bit it's called the pyloric sphincter and then in the duodenum we have now other attachments like the pancreas is attached to the duodenum together with its pancreatic duct we also have the liver associated to the duodenum through the gallbladder through the bile bile duct you can see them there the bile duct joins to the duodenum all the way from the the, the gallbladder which is actually housed within the liver yes and then you move down as you move after the duodenum what is the next part the ileum after the duodenum you have the ileum so the ileum is highly coiled i can i think you can see it is highly folded and relatively smaller but highly folded later on we shall see why why is the ileum highly folded now the ileum and the duodenum together are called the small intestines the ileum together with the duodenum are collectively called the small intestines perfect so after the ileum you go to the colon but well we have the uh, the reduced structures there which may not necessarily perform action of digestion like the appendix yeah of recent the appendix does not perform any digestive role but uh, well it's a degenerate structure that used to perform serious role as this uh, in in the ancient organism in ancient man i should say organisms where we evolved from were using this the the, the cecum and the appendix very successfully but as we evolved into human the appendix is a, a degenerate structure it no longer performs any significant digestive role but after that we go to the colon the colon is now in that large uh, intestine the, i mean the, that large part extended part after the small intestine we have the colon that box shape there now from your drawing you are seeing is the colon then we have the rectum the rectum so the rectum together with the colon are the large intestines so we are going to see the parts and the functions later on what each part uh, performs so i want you to draw the structure 
the diagram of the digestive system, draw the parts that we have talked about, and then send me that picture. So your assignment for now is to draw the digestive system and send me that picture. Great, and I know you can do it. So let's look at part by part. Starting with the mouth. So the mouth has the teeth, which we know very well. And also the salivary gland that we have seen. The mouth opens to the large space called the buccal cavity. The mouth, that open part of the mouth, the inner surface, is called the buccal cavity. The mouth is roofed by the palate. It's called the palate, not the plate. It is called the, 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 the hard palate, which is continuous with the soft palate. Now, that upper part of the mouth is called the roof of the mouth. I want you to feel it with your tongue. You will feel that it is rigid and hard. That one is called the hard palate. Then you move your tongue behind. Behind the hard palate, there is another soft part. It's called the soft palate or the pharynx. So those two parts there coordinate. The hard palate controls movement of food during chewing. Then the soft palate is, is elastic and soft. Enable to enable swallowing because it is continuous with the esophagus. Then once the food is in the buccal cavity, so the hard palate, soft palate, the pharynx, all is called the buccal cavity. So when the food is in the buccal cavity, the teeth will break down the food particles into smaller particles. Yes, during the chewing process. And this one provides a large surface area for enzyme action. Yes. So as food is chewed, you are increasing a surface area such that enzymes, for example, saliva amylase and other subsequent enzymes can easily act on that food. That is what we call increasing the surface area or exposing more food particles to be acted upon by enzymes. So on the floor of the buccal cavity is a long muscular organ, the tongue which is covered by the test buds. I want you to look at your tongue using a mirror. You look at it critically. You will see some small dots. Uh, you will see some small dots on the tongue. Those, one, those structures, those beautiful structures are what we call the test buds. They are called what? The test buds. And they are found in your tongue. And the tongue is very muscular. It is a hard muscle. So the tongue moves food around the mouth for chewing to occur and mixing with the saliva secreted by the salivary glands. Saliva contains an enzyme or enzymes and mucus which moistens, softens and lubricates food as well as sticking food particles together in boluses or round round things for easy swallowing. The enzyme in the saliva is called salivary amylase. Sometimes it's called tyalin. That word can be pronounced as tyalin. So we have the tongue. The tongue rolls and moves the food, rolling it into small uh, bol round particles called boluses that can easily be swallowed. And then as it rolls, it enables mixing of the food with the saliva. Yes? So that the enzyme saliva amylase can enter and begin reacting with the, the food. So therefore, the tongue should be very important. The tongue should be very important. It of course has other functions that uh, we cannot talk about here, but it has other many other functions. Um, then we have the esophagus. After the mouth, we enter into the esophagus, sometimes called the gullet. So this is a straight tube that passes from the mouth through the thorax and the diaphragm into the abdomen. So that also focuses, as you saw in your, on your drawing diagram earlier, it's a long tube that runs from the mouth through the thorax into the stomach. So when food is fully chewed, the tongue rolls into boluses. When pushes it against the soft palate at the back of the mouth or the pharynx, this initiates a process of swallowing and food uh, into the esophagus. So swallowing is an instantaneous process. It's a reflex action. You cannot be controlled by will. You cannot control the way you are swallowing. 
It's a reflex act. As soon as food reaches the soft palate or the pharynx, the swallowing process is initiated automatically, and then you swallow. Unknowingly, you swallow very many things as you chew, you are swallowing without even your will or control of the will. We shall look at this more in the coordination. The tube adjacent to the esophagus is the trachea, which leads to the lungs. So when you see the neighbor of the esophagus is the trachea. That one is much more hard and rigid and uh, usually not very flexible. And that one is entering to the lungs. So that one is another system called the respiratory system. But here, we are, let's focus more on the digestive system. And uh, during swallowing, the flap of the tissue called the epiglottis above the trachea prevents food from entering the trachea. So we have above the trachea, this, these two things are connected. The trachea, which is part of the respiratory system, and the esophagus, which is part of the digestive system, are connected at a point called the epiglottis. So that epiglottis, when you are swallowing, it closes hmm, the trachea such that the food does not enter into the trachea, into the lungs. So that's why when you are chewing and swallowing, you should not talk at the same time. When you talk, when you are chewing, the chances are high that food may enter into your trachea and will cause serious sneezing uh, to expel that food away from the, trache the trachea because that is not its right route. So you should be disciplined as you are eating. First eat properly, swallow your food well, and then talk later. Okay, let's proceed. After the gullet or the esophagus, we have the stomach. So the gullet opens to the stomach, which has a cardiac sphincter muscle at the entrance and the pyloric sphincter muscle at the exit. The sphincter is a circular band of muscles. So we talked about this cardiac sphincter allows entry, regulates the entry of food into the stomach, and the pyloric sphincter uh, regulates the exit of the food. Then after the stomach, we have the small intestines. The small intestines are long and coiled, which with a length of about six to seven meters in man. Can you imagine? Six to seven meters. It's very long. But you cannot see the length because it's highly coiled. But when you stretch it, it's about six to seven meters in an adult man. It's made up of two parts, the ilium and the duodenum. So we have the ilium and the duodenum. Those are the two parts of the small intestines. When you combine all of the two, we call them small intestines. So let's start with one of them, the duodenum or duodenum. This is the first part of the small intestine. It is short and wider than the ilium. It bends into a loop to accommodate the pancreas, like we explained earlier. The pancreas is also attached on the side to the duodenum. The duct passes open into the duodenum are the bile duct from the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreatic duct from the pancreas. We shall later on see why those ducts supply the duodenum. There is a duct from the bile, from the gallbladder, called the bile duct, which brings the bile from the gallbladder to the duodenum. And then we have another duct from the pancreas to the duodenum, and that one is called pancreatic duct, which brings uh, materials from the pancreas, especially the enzymes, to the duodenum, as we shall see later on. Then we, let's look at functions of the bile. The bile contains a high percentage of water and adds it to the food coming from the stomach called the chyme. It, it is alkaline and neutralizes the hydrochloric acid uh, of the chyme. The chyme is supposed to be C-H-Y-M-E, not C-H-I. The chime, C H Y M E. Sorry for that spelling error. So it's alkaline, and you know the stomach is acidic, so the bile is alkaline and therefore neutralizes the acids that might have moved with the food from the stomach. And then we have, and of course, you know, the, the, the pancreatic juice works best in the alkaline medium. Then it also reduces the surface tension of fats and breaks them into minute droplets. That is to say, it emulsifies it. So the, 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 the bile emulsifies the fats, breaks them into small, small droplets, 
So uh, that's what, what is physical digestion? To enable chemical digestion to take place easily. And then we have the ileum now. This is the second part of the small intestines. It is a long and coiled with a length of about 6 to 7 meters in man. It involves digestion and absorption. Its lining has numerous tiny finger-like structures called the villi. One is called the villus, which increases the surface area for absorption. So the ileum, the major role of the ileum is absorption of the food. Why? It's because it has structures called the, the villi, where absorption takes place. So what takes place in the ileum is majorly absorption of the food. And that's why it is very long. So as to increase the surface area for absorption. To increase the length over which absorption occurs. Then we have the large intestines. In man, it contains the colon, appendix, and the rectum, which open to the anus. In rabbits, the large intestines consist of the cecum, which is very large, and ends in the blind appendix and small colon leading to the rectum. Yeah. So in man, we don't have the cecum, and even when we have the appendix, it does not perform any significant digestive role. But we have the colon and the rectum. So let's start with digestion in the mouth. I want to go now step by step to see what actually happens. So in the mouth, there exists both physical and chemical digestion. Physical digestion in the mouth is carried, about, carried by the action of teeth. Yes, in a process of chewing or mastication, as we said earlier, that in the mouth there is chewing of the food, which actually is what we call physical digestion, breaking it down into smaller particles. Why is chewing important? Is chewing important? Yes, it's important. When you chew the food, it has advantages, and they include the following. One, chewing increases the surface area of food for efficient enzyme action. As you chew, you are breaking it down into small, 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 small particles. Therefore, you have increased surface area over which enzymes can act. Two, it helps to mix food with the saliva, and in so doing, it softens that food uh, it also mixes it with enzymes and it lubricates it with mucus in the saliva. So therefore, chewing is really very good. And before you swallow the food, at least you chew it. At least if it is a solid food, it's necessary to chew. Why would you have to swallow this food without chewing? You are limiting enzyme activity. Mm? That food will take long to be digested because it has a smaller surface area. Mm? I saw people, when they are eating bananas, they don't chew. You just swallow because it is soft. No, but you need to chew, at least for some time, to break it down, to simplify the work of the enzymes. With the help of the tongue, the food is rolled into the bolus, into what we call a bolus, or a small ball, for easy swallowing and movement in the gut or the alimentary canal. So the tongue is very important in rolling the food into small boluses that can easily be swallowed. Chewing stimulates enzyme secretion because the secretion of saliva is a reflex action stimulated by the presence of food in the mouth. Do you know why chewing is very important again? It's because as you put food in the mouth and you begin chewing, you are stimulating enzymes to be secreted, both in the mouth and the stomach. Yes, so those enzymes now will be secreted knowing that the food is coming. So if you do not chew, if you just swallow food the way you swallow medicine, um, the saliva, the enzymes may not be secreted in time and will affect the process of digestion. So members, the secretion of saliva can also be stimulated by sight, smell, and salt of food. I mean that word is thought, not salt, with the th thinking. When you see the food which is delicious, sometimes you begin to salivate. Yes, it's a reflex act. It's connected to the brain. 
the brain begins interpreting uh, uh, it, it, it begins interpreting that you need to eat you need to secrete enzymes when you smell good food you also enzymes get secreted including saliva saliva amylase saliva even in the stomach if you constantly smell good food when you are hungry your stomach starts paining i mean you start feeling stomach discomfort why the the the, the stomach walls will secrete the, the the gastric juice waiting for that good smelling food now when it doesn't go there that is where the problem will be it will start acting on you as we shall see later on yeah and even when you think about food like you ate very good food yesterday and then today you sit and you're hungry begin thinking about that good food saliva may start flowing and even other enzymes will also be secreted so it's a warning that it's good to eat in time eat in time whenever you get hungry at least get something to eat don't delay unless if there is no food but if it is there do not wait do not starve otherwise you may expose your digestive system to corrosion of enzymes which may lead to uh, either gastric ulcers or uh, even other complications then let's look at chemical digestion in in the mouth chemical digestion is carried out by an enzyme that we call saliva amylase yes or tyrin remember we said in the mouth we have two types of digestion physical digestion which involves chewing and action of the tongue and then we have chemical digestion which involves action of an enzyme majorly an enzyme is saliva amylase so members saliva is an alkaline watery solution and provides an optimal ph for the action of amylase yes that is to say a high ph so saliva is alkaline in nature and saliva amylase works best in alkaline medium or slightly neutral medium so the ph of the mouth is the best for the action of saliva amylase and members what is important again for us to notice that this saliva amylase acts majorly on cooked starch if you eat your raw cassava and you expect your saliva amylase to act on it it may be very difficult it majorly acts on cooked starch and it breaks it down to a disaccharide called maltose yeah it acts on a cooked starch breaking it to maltose yes so and then after that we have swallowing act of swallowing we said swallowing is a reflex action you cannot plan to swallow uh -uh. like you first plan to chew 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 then after chewing then you begin planning to swallow no it's a reflect reflex act a reflex act is not controlled by will meaning you cannot be willing to swallow you cannot be unwilling to swallow as soon as the food reaches the pharynx the soft palate swallowing is automatic and you cannot stop it when it starts so it's automatic we shall look at those reflex actions more in a topic called coordination make sure you are there to see to to, to learn more about reflex actions uh, and then we have uh, this food is rolled into a bolus which is then transferred into the esophagus or the gallus during the act of swallowing breathing momentarily stops and epiglottis closes the entrance into the trachea preventing from the entering of the food into the trachea so when you are, you cannot swallow and breathe at the same time it's not possible it's automatic so that these two systems do not uh, affect the processes don't affect each other breathing is separate from swallowing but there's a connection between the trachea and the esophagus at the epiglottis so therefore the body has a mechanism of preventing collision between these two systems such that food does not enter the storm uh, the, 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 the trachea and vice versa air shouldn't be entering to the stomach so you cannot swallow and breathe at the same time you can try it out and see just swallow your saliva and attempt to breathe it may be challenging 
I know you have tried it, it's challenging, right? At the same time, the soft palate also closes the entrance into the nose cavity, preventing food from escaping or passing through the nose. Remember, you have internal nares. The nose is connected to the mouth at some point. Eh? That's why you can see mucus entering to the mouth or from the mouth to the nose. There's a connection. But when you are swallowing, food cannot pass through the nose. So the nose also closes as you swallow. The nose and the trachea will close such that food does not enter into the respiratory system. But of course, at some point when you, you cannot swallow, I had a friend of mine whose mouth jaw was operated and it was locked so he could not open it. So food was to be passed through using a tube through the nose. Uh, they put the mouth, the, the tube through the nose, and then of course now the food must be liquid. It must be fluid, meaning it could not chew. So the food was already broken down, and then it, it is just pumped through a tube direct to the esophagus. Then it keeps on just swallowing it. That was an un unfortunate uh, state because he suffered an accident suffered injuries from an accident and that's how he ended. but eventually he recovered and now he's okay so yes food can pass through under medical guidance so once the boluses are in the esophagus the food moves by a wave of muscular contractions called peristalsis i want us to pronounce that word peristalsis so peristalsis is a process by which the food moves through a wave of action of muscles from the mouth to the stomach via the esophagus. That is, it moves by a process of peristalsis. Then we, we are now at the stomach. Now that we have food in the stomach, it has moved by peristalsis to the stomach. What will happen there now? So most of the digestion of the stomach is chemical. I'm not saying all. But most of the digestion in the stomach is chemical digestion. Uh, so food is allowed into the stomach from the esophagus by a ring of muscles that we called the cardiac sphincter. So in the stomach, there is only protein digestion. So what happens? The gastric juice is secreted and it contains two enzymes, pepsin and renin. And then it contains also hydrochloric acid, mucus, and water. So we have um, a juice, a, a liquid secreted in the stomach called gastric juice, which contains enzymes that digest the proteins. It also contains hydrochloric acid. Then it contains mucus and water. Pepsin, that enzyme called pepsin, acts upon proteins. Pepsin acts on what? Proteins, breaking them down into polypeptides breaks down proteins which foods to contain proteins well we have leguminous seeds like beans uh, cowpeas groundnuts and so on we have meat uh, beef pork and many others so that food there is acted upon by pepsin so pepsin acts upon proteins breaking them down into polypeptides Pepsin is initially secreted in, a, in an inactive form called pepsinogen, which is activated into active pepsin by hydrochloric acid. This is a, a, to safeguard the mechanism because if pepsin was stored in its active form, it would destroy the gut walls or stomach walls since they are also protein in nature. Therefore, the body would be carrying out what we call autodigestion or self-digestion. So that is prevented. How? Because through pepsin being stored or secreted in an inactive form called pepsinogen, which is only activated when the protein food is present in the stomach. Yes. Otherwise, if pepsin is secreted in its active form, into the stomach it will start acting on the stomach walls themselves because they are also protein in nature uh, corroding them probably leading to gastric ulcers uh, then pepsin works best at a low ph which is acidic in nature provided by the presence of hydrochloric acid that's why we have hydrochloric acid in that secretion and then renin another enzyme coagulates milk and makes it insoluble 
it converts the soluble milk protein casinogen into an insoluble card called casein, which is then acted upon by pepsin still, breaking it down into polypeptide. Renin is important enzyme, especially in young mammals, since they feed majorly on milk. So renin is majorly in young mammals, and major role is to coagulate proteins. Uh, protein, uh, proteins called, uh, I mean milk proteins called casein, caseinogen into an insoluble form casein, which can easily be acted upon by uh, pepsin. Then after, now we know what happens in the mouth. We know the food acted upon in the mouth. Uh, starch into maltose. We know now the food acted upon in the stomach, proteins into polypeptides, and we have seen what happens. So let's go to the duodenum. But before we go to the duodenum, I have an assignment for you. I want you to give me the functions of hydrochloric acid. Yes, give me the functions of hydrochloric acid. We have talked about it, we have hinted about it, and I have given way for you to give more. At least give four functions of hydrochloric acid and send me I want to see that's assignment number two the first assignment is you draw and label the diagram of the digestive system of man then two you now give me the functions of hydrochloric acid so let's move to digestion in the duodenum the chime the word chime I told you in most books and correctly it should be C-H-Y-M-E. The chime from the stomach enters the duodenum. The chime is the semi-solid, semi-fluid food. The food which is now semi-fluid, ready for digestion, which is broken down. Yeah. It moves now from the stomach uh, from, to the duodenum via the pyloric sphincter I told you about which regulates entry, exit of that food, slowly, slowly, and bits as it enters into the duodenum, because the stomach is bigger than the duodenum. So if this food just pours from the stomach to the duodenum, the duodenum will be jammed with the food, with the chime. So there are access organs which provide secretions. Which organs are there are associated with the duodenum? We are talking about the liver, the pancreas, the gallbladder. They secrete the bile from the gallbladder and pancreatic juice from the pancreas. The word pancreas does not have E at the end. It's a typing error there, so you correct. The arrival of food in the duodenum stimulates the production of the hormone called secretin from the pancreas and another hormone called cholecystokinin, which stimulates secretion of the bile from the gallbladder. So as soon as the food arrives to the duodenum, it just stimulates secretion of those two, two hormones. Hormone secretin and cholecystokinin. And these ones stimulate secretion of the bile from the gallbladder. Hmm? That is cholecystokinin. Then secretin stimulates secretion of pancreatic juice. The secretion, the secretions are alkaline, thus stopping the action of Pepsin provides an ideal medium for enzymes in the pancreatic juice to work. Pancreatic juice contains a number of enzymes which are called the pancreatic enzymes. So those secretions from the bile are alkaline. They have a high pH and they provide the best condition. They first of all neutralize the acid that might have moved with the food from the stomach. Remember the stomach is acidic in nature. So as the food comes to the duodenum, it contains some acid. That means that food, that chime has a low pH. So as soon as it arrives at the duodenum, the bile, which is alkaline, will neutralize the acids. And then, therefore, providing an alkaline medium for action of pancreatic enzymes. So these pancreatic enzymes include the following. We have one called the trypsin which acts on proteins, breaking them down to peptides and amino acids. Remember, some proteins are still re remaining in the food. Not all the proteins were broken down from the stomach. So digestion of proteins still continues to the duodenum, where we have the trypsin, which acts on the proteins, breaking them to, poly to peptides and amino acids. Then we have pancreatic amylase, 
which breaks down starch to maltose. Remember, amylase is also found in the saliva, saliva amylase, but not all the starch was broken down from the mouth. So some starch will continue being digested in the duodenum, where there's another amylase enzyme called pancreatic amylase, breaking down starch into maltose. Then we have pancreatic lipase, which breaks down lipids into fatty acids and glycerol. This is the first time lipids are, are broken down in the in the in the duodenum. So we have majorly those three enzymes in our in the duodenum. Therefore, in the duodenum we have trypsin, pancreatic amylase, and pancreatic lipase. And the digestion of proteins, starch, and lipids take place in the duodenum. Trypsin is also secreted in an inactive form, trypsinogen, to prevent it from digesting the duodenum walls. Remember, trypsin is also a protein digesting enzyme, and the, 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 the duodenum walls are also protein in nature. Therefore, if trypsin was to be secreted as a trypsin, it would start breaking down duodenal walls, corroding them, probably creating corrosion or wounds around the duodenum. But uh, that, that one is solved because trypsin will be secreted as trypsinogen, which is inactive and is just activated when a food is there so that they digest on food directly. Both trypsin and pancreatic amylase act upon proteins and starch, respectively, that were not broken down in the stomach and the mouth, respectively. That's what we have just explained. So let's move to the ileum. The ileum. The, this is where final digestion takes place. Very important for us to note that it is in the ileum where final digestion takes place. The food moves down from the duodenum into the ileum by a process of peristalsis. Let me ask, where else does peristalsis take place? I had just talked about it. Yes, it takes place in the movement of food between the mouth and the stomach through the esophagus. It moves by a process of peristalsis. Also, the movement from the duodenum to the ileum also takes place by a process of peristalsis, a wave of muscle contractions. The presence of food in the ileum stimulates the secretion of an, an intestinal juice called sacasentericus. Yes, sacasentericus by the walls of the ileum. So as soon as the food arrives at the ileum, sacasentericus is secreted. This sacasentericus, this intestinal juice, contains several enzymes which complete the process of digestion forming a milky fluid substance called the chyle. Food after final digestion is called the chyle. Yeah, that chyle is formed now in the ileum. So in the ileum, these enzymes are present, and the food they act upon and the products. The summary is there. There is an enzyme called sucrase. It is there in the ileum. It is part of the sacasentericus secreted. It has sucrase acts on sucrose, breaking it down to glucose and fructose, which are now ready to be absorbed. They are now final, final products of digestion of starch, uh, glucose and sucrose. Then we have maltose. I'm sorry, we have maltase enzyme, which breaks down maltose into glucose. That is a final digestion now of maltose. Then we have lactase enzyme, breaking down lactose, which is usually found in milk, into glucose and galactose. Peptidase enzyme, breaking down polypeptides. Remember, polypeptides were produced from the stomach, action of pepsin, and action of trypsin in the duodenum. Now, those polypeptides are broken down by peptidase into amino acids, which are final building blocks for proteins, which can easily be absorbed by the body. Then we have lipase enzyme, which acts on lipids. Remember, lipids were acted upon at the by pancreatic lipase, but still, some lipids will still remain. And in the ileum, in the ileum, final digestion of these products takes place. What is not digested in the ileum 
members will not be digested anywhere else and that food now will come out as feces yes in a process we talked about a gestion or defecation so the ileum is the last stage where the food stops over in the process of digestion and these final products we have talked about glucose fructose galactose amino acids fatty acids and glycerol are the very very final products that will be absorbed by the body and remember we had said the ileum is where absorption takes place so members the composition of the child the child is now the, 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 the that last bit of food that has those final products that the composition of the child is a group of soluble products of digestion namely glucose fructose amino acid glycerol vitamins mineral salts though that is now what is found in the child in the small in the ileum yeah so that one now is absorbed in the ileum and then taken to the body to the liver passed through the hepatic portal vein and then we have digestion in the large intestines or the colon particularly in the colon members water and mineral salts are absorbed so in the colon there is no digestion physical or chemical but there is absorption of water and mineral salts the undigested and indigested food substances pass down into the large intestines which are eventually removed from the body as feces through the anus there is no digestion in the large intestine accumulation of hard particles like stones small sticks in the appendix results into a condition known as appendicitis the appendix is thus removed surgically by simple operation so we have probably heard about some people who were surgically operated on their appendix they probably suffered from appendicitis this is where solid particles if you are eating food for example rice that has stones eh, or small wooden sticks that cannot be digested hard hard particles glass water and so on if you eat them they will accumulate in a place called the appendix because they are heavier they will settle in the child and then they settle down and they will be taken to the appendix when the appendix gets full you suffer from appendicitis and one of the symptoms is that you'll 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 experience lower abdominal pain and also difficulty in defecating and it's painful yeah but can be surgically removed by a simple operation yeah called it's a simple operation surgically to remove those stones and then you'll be okay so avoid eating uh those uh, hard hard particles and sort the rice sort your food before you cook so that you do not eat the body does not have a mechanism of digesting stones and those other hard particles don't eat them yeah i see most of you only moving around you are chewing grass you are chewing what you may suffer from these problems one time i see people chewing my runji chewing what these are things which cannot be digested so you are actually putting yourself at a risk of in the long run maybe suffering from appendicitis and no we don't suffer from that i don't want you to uh, suffer from that yes so be good be good students and eat what you are supposed to eat so i have two questions there and i want you to answer them the first one is describe the digestion process that occurs when a person consumes a portion eh, now very soon we are going back to school actually even at home you have been eating portion hmm? don't tell me you have not been eating portion uh -uh. you have been eating portion even me have been eating so when you eat it it takes a long process of digestion i want you to describe that one i will give you some good marks eh, so you send your essay I want to see that beautiful essay you have written about the process that occurs when a person consumes a portion the process of digestion it will be very unfortunate if you cannot describe how portion is digested and what food substance is contained in the portion is what we are talking about starch and the same applies to other starch containing food then question two 
Describe the process of digestion of proteins in man. You also do that question. Write that essay and send me. I would be interested in seeing how those answers are you are responding to that question. I want to thank you very much. You have been wonderful students. And thank you for following these good online lessons. In case you enjoyed this lesson, you can share it with other friends online. You can share with them. You can also subscribe to this YouTube channel for such good lessons. Uh, please continue staying at home until it is safer for you to return back to school. Goodbye.